slave ships. Like, wow. Let's That's talk about it. Let's, 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 let's talk about this subject and really get into it. Okay. You know, so let's, you know, let's talk about slave ships. And what, what's the first thing that you can tell me when you talk, when you rethink about the subject of slave ships? Well, the first thing that I think about is that they, that they were really just ships not specifically slave ships, because what they were was cargo ships that got converted into slave ships. What can you tell me about these cargo ships? You know, let's, you know, just start off with the basics. You know, ships existed. We have records of them everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, slave ships weren't necessarily, the ships weren't built to carry slaves. So for the most part, they were converted to carry slaves. Yes, okay. and now um, there were over a hundred different kinds of ships, or, or you know, sailing vessels, the, the things that, that you travel on the water <laughs> with. <laughs> there was over a hundred of over them. Kinds that yes, were built, uh, during colonial times. And yes, and what I found out is because um, I wanted to find out what kinds of uh, ships were being used mm -hmm. to transport the slaves. Okay. You know, so um, I did go to slavevoyages.org, mm -hmm. which is a website that is uh, dedicated to the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, what they have is they have about, what they say is about three-fourths of the, uh, the ships that docked in the Americas, mm -hmm. they have about three-quarters of them documented. And so if you go there, you can find out where they documented their information from, which is from several sources. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I use it as a trustworthy website to go to. Okay. So when I went there and as I was researching these ships, I found out that there were really five particular kinds of ships that I kept running into over and over and over and over again. Okay. And so, yeah, so let's... What kind of ships were there? What are, what are their names? Sloops, schooners, brigs or brigadiers, snows, and ships of the line, or what they just called them, just ships. Okay, yeah, okay, so these ships here, and not just these ships, but other ships, you know, where, you know, the question is, okay, well, where were these ships being built? You know, that's a, it's a valuable question because, you know, we talk about land, we're talking about resources as far as the timber is concerned, and a lot of other things that you need in order to build hundreds and thousands of ships, you know. So where were these ships being built during colonial times? Okay, well, we know that ships were being built worldwide. Right, we okay. know that the Chinese were building <laughs> ships way before anything else, along with a whole bunch of other people, but <laughs> we're talking about Times. <laughs> uh, okay, well, during that time, what is interesting is that I found out that um, while ships were being built worldwide, that the ships that the United States started building really turned out to be, and then the United States ships turned out to be the ship building ships that everyone wanted to use. And so the United States then became like the ship building capital. Of the world. Yes. So, during the 1700s. During the 1700s, <laughs> through, as we ask ourselves the question, the, a valuable question, and we explore that, the facts have come out that, you know, America actually was the capital of the shipbuilding industry during the 1700s. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's very interesting because, you know, that's not a part of American history that's really discussed. I actually don't remember that as a part of my public education. Well, and, and no, and they don't really, they don't really tell these things. Um, and really, uh, what was going on is that as these, uh, as these cities, or really as people were moving into the colonies, mm -hmm. you have to clear the, uh, you, you have to, you have to clear the domain, you have to clear it. So they had to clear cut, trees so that you can make way for housing, schools, businesses. And so as these cities started getting bigger and bigger, they were tearing down the trees and then they were using the lumber. Of course, the lumber was being used for all sorts of things, but the ships was one of the big things because th this is what was 
making money for the United States. Right, as we said, you know, it became the capital of the shipbuilding industry. And so just think about the economic empowerment that it gave the United States, or at least the colonial United States, as it was developing. It was definitely a major part of the economic development, along with, of course, the slaves that were being used to build the ships. <laughs> to build to the, the ships, land, to yeah. clear the land, to transport the timber, right. to, uh, <laughs> they, well, they were used in every, <laughs> wait, 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 every wait, wait. aspect. Let's talk about these ship, uh, ship building yards and where, where they were. Again, we're talking about 1600, 1700. Yes, well, the, again, uh, where they started out were at the ports. Mm -hmm. And these ports are basically where your large cities were coming up. Okay. Okay, so uh, these ports were, um, what turned into your major ports mm -hmm. was uh, Boston, Rhode Island, uh, New York, okay. and, uh, and Philadelphia, okay. which became uh, very big ports up in the north and these were the places where these they, they became the shipbuilding capitals up in the north okay, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact in uh, 1720 that uh philadelphia wait a minute let me make sure because i want to make sure it, it, yes in philadelphia there were at least a dozen shipyards a dozen shipyards and 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 that is because there were there was an abundance of trees in that area but also because of the waterways that um, that they were able, Philadelphia in particular, was able to get trees from further away than like than Boston mm -hmm. or like in New York. And so what happened is that by 1750, that Philadelphia turned into the capital of making ships. Okay. So they became the shipbuilding capital, Philadelphia by 1750. All right, and so we actually answered the, uh a few questions there. It's like, you know, one of the questions is, so where did they get all of the trees to build all of these ships? And we could say, look at the concrete jungles of the United <laughs> States. How about, <laughs> you know, I mean, honestly, you know, a lot of the, the trees, you know, specifically Philadelphia, you know, prior to colonization, Philadelphia was a straight up forest. Yes. You know, we had waterfalls in Philadelphia. We had, you know, Philadelphia was a forest. And then in the middle of this forest, as in most places here, you know, big chiefdoms where you had thousands of peoples cohabitating, you know, mound complexes, and then centered around that, you know, they were living in tune with nature, and so. And what is interesting, though, is that many of these ports and these kinds of things were basically set up. Next and, to mound complexes. Well, how about they took over the mound complexes? Mm -hmm. You know, they, they were utilizing the them. Yes, okay. they, they utilized them because they, they were already there. Right. Why are you going to not use something that is already there? Okay, you right. And so, so to get back, so now, okay, the, the, the timber being used is coming from the United States. Yes. The United States becomes the major capital for shipbuilding for the world for quite a few years, mm -hmm. at least a, a 50 to 100 years. And, and so let's get into how this happened and, and why this happened. You know, and, and specifically, I want to talk about the trees and the timber itself. Okay, well, uh, well, one of the things about Philadelphia and why it became the shipbuilding capital is not only because of location, which was, you know, again, being able to bring the uh, things from further away, but by the middle of the 17th century, uh, Boston and New York they were starting to deplete those trees. Okay. And uh, so they needed to start looking for an area now where they can get an abundance of trees. Uh, now, of course, the further west you go where people haven't been living, of course, there, there's always going to be an abundance of trees here that they could use. I mean, for United their States is so vast. Yes, yes. Uh, but what happened is that what they started looking further south and then they, they started realizing that uh, some of the trees that they were finding now in Georgia and South Carolina, that uh, they had particular trees that were called red oak, no, not live the red oak, oak, the live oak trees, mm -hmm. okay? And live oak was uh, a very dense uh, wood, and they found that this wood was a much better quality oak than just even regular oak. Okay. So they uh, they started using the uh, this live oak now 
uh, for the boats, and now you have ships now that will be lasting even longer. Right. And not only were they finding this live oak down in the south, but they also found another source for pine trees, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and red cedar then also became popular, especially with that type of boat that was called schooners. Okay. The, uh, a lot of merchants liked the schooners and the red cedar that was used for the schooners, they were saying because the, uh, the wood was very dense, it lasted, and, uh, but it was also lightweight so it could make a trip a little bit faster than some of the other ones. And if, I, if I'm not mistaken from the research, they, so the, the, that ship's hair being built in the Americas because of the wood and uh, the, well, because of the wood, some of, some of the ships were actually make two, three, four trips where the European made ships would only maybe take one or two at best. Per year. Per year. Per okay. year, yes. Because of all of the upkeep that was necessary. Right, exactly, yes. Right. Which leads us to another question. I was wondering if we should in, um, include this because it kind of goes off topic, but it actually it doesn't. Because, you know, first we're talking about the slave ships and the fact that they existed, the fact that we have so much information about it also verifies all of the information we have to prove the low numbers of Africans being shipped directly into the United States. It's further verification of, you know, the statement that everybody running around with, you know, only 5% of the slave population came directly from Africa. I think I heard that a couple of times. Okay, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> but beyond that, you know, beyond that, you know, as, a, as, as, as we contemplate that idea, when we start doing research on the ships and what was happening and you know, we started looking, you know, we like to look at the journals, we like to look at the logs, we like to look at the, 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 the numbers. Cargo, you know, what was being carried on how, this trip. How many were on the ships? How many and people were on the ship? How many were crew members versus, you know, how many were passengers and you versus know what slaves? And you know what is interesting, uh, uh, which we really didn't get to, the, but the, the numbers that were on the uh, ships, most of those ships were carrying less than 100 people, the right. ones that I was, that I ran into. Now, of course, there were that carried, that, that were, that carried more. Mm -hmm. But you'll see like the ships that were like schooners and the sloops, they, they, they were not very large. Mm -hmm. So they didn't carry a large cargo because they had additional cargo besides slaves right. that they would, that, that right. was being because shipped. It was, it's more money to be made. Just <laughs> right, <not> right, <laughs> yeah, slaves was not the only money source. Okay, <laughs> and so as we do, as, as we deal with that reality, you know, um, we were going through this and we started to see a depletion in the number of slaves being transported in the, into, you know, the colonial United States um, after this, you know, late, late 1700s, early 1800s. You know, I wanted to touch on that just a little bit so that, you know, we people can get a, you know, some, some kind of idea about what was happening with the politics at that time also. Yes, well, what, what most people don't realize is that, that the slave trade, the slave trade itself, had been abolished way before 1865. Mm. Uh, the, the first slave trade act of the United States was actually in uh, 1794. Okay. And wow. uh, let me put my glasses on again. And it was, it was a law that was passed by, by the United States Congress that limited the United States involvement in the slave trade. It limited their involvement, but it didn't stop it. Uh, there were several amendments that were added to that, uh, trying to strengthen the act. And they finally came out in 18, well, it came out in 1807. It came out, as a matter of fact, on March 2nd of 1807. And it was a bill that was called, and I have to read it, an act to prohibit the importation of slaves into any part or place within the jurisdiction of the United States from and after the first day of January in the year of our Lord, 1808. <laughs> so what this means is that what was to begin on January 1st of 1808 is that they were supposed to be outlawing 
the importation of slaves. Now what we have to realize is that this was the importation or bringing them to the shores of the United States. That was outlawed. One thing though that it did not outlaw and that was slavery. All right, and, and let's talk about that for a moment because I think this is, this is why I wanted to bring this up um, as a part of you know, slave ships because it's important. And that's that despite the decrease and you know, you know, even though it was outlawed, even though you know, it was outlawed that you could not bring slaves into the United States, that didn't mean that it still wasn't happening. We had pirates and other things. Um, as a matter of fact, the United States was at war at times and they would actually grab, you know, any ship that they would hold, they would, you know, they would, they would enslave some of those captors. So the United States was actually <laughs> enslaving and, and taking ho over ships during this time, which is another they could, topic. They could take over a ship. And again, because it was outlawed, then what they could do is they would find the, the, the ship uh, the, the ship no, owner, okay, right, okay. Right, right, right. they may find some of the people that were there on the ship, the crew, they may find them, I'm not sure. But, and then, so they were making money off of that, mm -hmm. but then they also took the slaves. So they still made money off of the slaves anyway. So. Okay, yeah, and so <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. So, but however, beyond that, you see a very large decrease in the number being you know, directly shipped here. Yes, you even know. though the numbers were small, like we said anyway, and because only though. about maybe 300,000 right. during the entire slave trade were bought directly to the shores of the United States. But then we see that uh, after 1800, that there was a very, very small number of slaves that were brought in. But what is interesting is that that is the time that the slave numbers grew substantially. Right, this, this went boom. Yes. You know, which is a whole nother point. And, and that's why we wanted to include that, you know. It's not referencing the ships, but it, it is, you know, because, you know, the reality that they're not bringing, they're bringing even less in than they have ever, mm -hmm. although the number is very small to begin with, 300,000, you know. But now, you know, it's 1,800, it's outlawed for the most part. So now the numbers is, not, instead of bringing them 50, 60,000, it's not, they're not even bringing that in anymore. But at the same time, the slave population internally just goes boom. Yes, yes. You know, and, and so to, ver to ver further verify that, you know, the slave, quote unquote, slave population in the United States, specifically in the southeastern portions. Homegrown. Right, homegrown, ha <laughs> ha. Homegrown. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get back to the question, slave ships, you know? Mm -hmm. And so we talked about the reality that, you know, they weren't actually slave ships. They were cargo ships of many varieties, um, specifically five being converted, converted into um, a ship that was more capable of carrying slaves during a journey. The reality that, well, most of us, and I didn't know this at the time, that the United States was <laughs> the shipbuilding capital of the world for a, a couple of years, for quite a while, not mm -hmm. even a few years, a mm -hmm. hundred years maybe. It may still be. But <laughs> with, yeah, well, <laughs> with respects to timber and wood, right? <laughs> and, the, and these ships that we, that's so much of our conversation in our community today. And so just by the way, just to let you know this, that, that they didn't start using metal on ships until the middle of the 1800s, and so by that time, uh, you know, shipping not a question anymore. And, and yeah, and shipping uh, slaves on, on, on ships that had metal was right, right, right. And then that, again, that hardly didn't about, even happen. And then we're talking about 1865 now, so now we're talking about a whole different part of you know American history. You know, however, we're, we're back to the slave thing, you know, this and this, these, these ships thing, you know, um, they existed, they were these types, they were being converted to ship slaves. You know, she, we were building ships, Boston, New York, Rhode Island, Philadelphia. You know, and eventually the wood from Georgia and South Carolina turned out to be the best for, for building the ships, you know. And now we get to the point where, okay, so now, where, where are they at? You know what I mean? Which is, again, a valuable question. You, you know, let's, 
let's figure out, you know, you know, we talked about where the ports were, you know, that was a valuable question. Well, where are the ports where all of these ships was coming in? Well, you know, we talked about that. Y'all can go research, you know, those cities' history, uh, you know, pictures and all kind of stuff. But now, where are the ships? You and know, what happened? what happened to these ships from colonial times and over time? You know, this is, that's a valuable question. Uh, that it is. And let's, let's think about that for a minute. And right. if you really think about it, uh, it's like, well, the biggest thing that, I mean, what would you do with something that you cannot use any longer? You want to see if you can use it for something else, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And really what happened with ships that were no longer useful to travel with, they would find other uses for them, okay. you know? So, um, and, and m many of them were used to make other ships as much as possible was used to even make another ship. Keep the cost down. There you Everything go. about money. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> bottom line. Oh right? yeah, yeah, bottom line, yes, yes. Money, money, money. Okay. And so now if you, and, and if you recall the, um, the, the trip with Christopher Columbus, mm -hmm. remember that when he came here, uh, one of his ships got grounded where uh, it could not make the trip back to, to Spain. So what they did is that they broke the ship down and uh, they built what they called a settlement, which was called La Navidad, okay, right. which is what they built because he had to leave behind a whole crew mm -hmm. because that whole boat wasn't making it back. So they made this settlement, La Navidad, that they used the wood from the ship, the, 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 the grounded ship that they, that they could not travel with. Right. So I mean, so that's a perfect example right there of one use, all of right? Of one use. Yeah, of right. one use, yes. So one, one way to reuse the wood from a ship. But that's just one of the ways that That's one way. one way. One way is this. If you have wood that is just totally rotten that you can't use anymore, guess what? There is a use for it. You can burn it to make some heat. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> when well, we're talking about colonial times now, and so you can, you know, that probably was his own industry. <laughs> you know, buy, you know, burn wood. You know. Yes. And but and, and and also remember, not only for heat though, but they had to use wood to cook with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now you have this wood that's around. There's there's no good wood that's just sitting around. You're gonna you you are going to use it. It's going to get used. Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, even if you, if you go to the horse stables and stuff today, you see the wood. <laughs> Being burnt in trash cans <laughs> all over the United States and hoods and underneath uh, highways and stuff like that. We will get burnt. But then that is even more reason. Uh, 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 they do use the wood for a whole lot of other things, too. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, 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 one thing, though, is, well, we, we know that they made them for, uh, they used them for buildings also. So we said that yeah. Columbus used it for a settlement, you know, but they also used them here even, uh, you know, on land here, you know, where you can use it to, uh, to, to build a school building mm -hmm. or, you know, you, well, you can know, use it for... Special, special ships they would use to make um, furniture. <laughs> oh, you know, and then they would give the furniture to the kings and queens and, you know, I mean, this is prestigious, this and this from this country or that country and it was a part of this boat or that boat. You know, I mean, I don't know, watch some American movies and you'll see it. You know what I mean? But beyond that, you know what I mean? Beyond that, people are still going to be like, okay, but still, where are the ships? ships. Where are the ships? Where okay, the ships? well, <laughs> guess what? There is one amazing fact, and, um, and, and again, after looking this up, I didn't even realize to right. the extent mm -hmm. that this is. Okay. And what this is is that there are thousands and thousands of ships that are in what is called ship graveyards. I'm going to stop. Pause. Thousands. 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 Okay, well, let's, let's, let's see thousands of ships and what they call ship graveyards here in the United States. Okay, well, there are, yeah, there are several, several ship graveyards, <laughs> like they're called. Again, they said that one thing, though, that, that where you will find ship graveyards is outside of every single port that the United States was using in the 18th and 19th century. Okay. You're definitely going to see uh, slave, oh, I mean, um, ship, what again, what, ship <laughs> graveyards, okay, <laughs> yes. All right, you're, you're going to find them, Okay. all right? And uh, there are, like I said, there are several of them. There are several big ones. Uh, there is one in particular that they call Mallows Bay 
This one is in, uh, this is outside of Virginia. Okay. And, and all of these ship graveyards are going to show ships from the 1700s, 1800s, and the 1900s. Mm. So they're going to show ships from all of them. And what we did is that we, we found the, the, the maps of some of these ship graveyards. Now, one thing about Mallows Bay that they, they say that, that you can see them even from Google Earth. What we did, and, we, and you'll be seeing some of these pictures uh, toward the end of the, uh, toward the end, we're going to be showing you some of these pictures, but some of them, you can see uh, that s some boats are still halfway in the water, halfway out. Mm -hmm. There are some where you can see the, you can see the image of them right below the water. And of course, a lot of them that, you know, we just can't even see, but they're there. They're there. Right. They're there. And like we said, some, some boats were intentionally sunk, and they still do that today, to make reefs mm -hmm. for the environment. Mm -hmm. You know, so some of those were intentionally put there. But uh, uh, a lot of them, they just, they just put there, and, 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 yeah, and they just they left them there. Okay. All right. Well, you know, that's just, um, that's really, it's really, that's just an overview of the question. You know, that's really just an overview of slave ships. You know, what's going on with them? You know, wh where, where are they? You know, what was, what are exactly are they? You know I mean? Again, they're not slave ships. They're cargo ships of different varieties that were converted to ship slaves. You know, and then beyond that, ports all up and down the East Coast, ship graveyards all up and down the East Coast, specifically Milo's Bay was one of the ones that we mentioned. Now, then, and, and then what we're going to do, though, is uh, National Geographic has made several maps which are showing where some of these ships that are off the coast, off the Atlantic coast, okay. where they are. Now, and so um, we're going to be showing, here's like one, for instance, that is showing ships from Massachusetts to Rhode Island, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Right. And then there's another one that is showing from Cape Henry, Virginia, down to Cape Fear, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of ships there. Well, you know what? As they look at those pictures, you know, let's wrap it up for them. And, you know, let me just say to you, we really do appreciate you checking us out. Uh, thank you very much for giving us the time to share this information with you. We, uh, we are doing a whole lot of things, and so we... We definitely would like for you to be involved, so please subscribe to us on our YouTube page. If you haven't liked us on uh, Facebook, please like our page, Indigenous Education. Um, and we always put in some new, well, we will consistently be putting some information out there. We have some educational lessons that we're offering online. And so if you're interested, definitely check our Facebook page out. We hit the flyer out on there. Um, we like to thank Red Silver Fox. Um, thank you very much. This is really good information. And again, as we go over what they call what Del Mar Valve, which is what we're going to be showing y'all now, which is a, sh a list of would you say how many different well, ships? There are over 2,400 ships just in this just in this area, in this which area is, is is the uh, and again let me let me make sure it is showing from the waters off the Delaware coast to the waters of the Chesapeake Bay. Okay. Over 2,400 wrecks there under the water. So thousands of slave ships, yes, where are they? Check the Dharma law, as they <laughs> said, right? But anyway, thank you very much. Um, please stay tuned, we have a lot more information. Please like us on Indigenous Education Facebook page. Uh, subscribe to us on YouTube, and uh, thank you very much. Peace. Peace. More problems, I saw them this way to tell you the truth. Allow me to reintroduce myself Welcome. to the cruel world that we all live in, man. Still chasing them dividends, whether it's thousands or millions. It's still a hustle, ain't it? The grind is universal.
Peace and welcome to part three of Where Are the Slave Ships? I'm Red Tail Hawk, also known as Tavis Sanders. I'd like to welcome my mother, Red Silver Fox, also known as Renee Sanders. Greetings. So in this episode, we are going to discuss uh, some of the, I guess, final points with respect to the slave ships. Um, you know, why so little evidence of slave ships, um, some of the locations, maybe talk about some specific ships that we know mm -hmm. of and you know, also go over, you know, w how they can tell what the differences are between different types of ships as they are going over the slave wrecks. I'm sorry, the shipwrecks themselves. Mm -hmm. And I guess speaking of shipwrecks, um, again, this is part three of Where Are the Slave Ships? And if you're interested in taking a look at part one and part two, we discuss not only the shipwrecks themselves and where some of them can be found, you know, why uh, so what, what happened to these ships, you know, once they were done being used, you know, recycling and other things like that. We talked about where the ships were being built, some of the ports, why specific wood was being used. And it, it also being an economic uh, boost to the United States economy for a hundred years, seeing as though they were all being built here. <laughs> <laughs> well, many of them were being built. <laughs> right, right. And so with that, let's wrap it up here and let's finish it off with the, 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 the wrecks themselves. And let's get into some specifics, uh, wrecks that we know are slave wrecks. But, you know, and, and talk about, I guess, why it's so many first. Well, why it is, why it is not so many. Oh, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> and uh, the thing is, is that very few uh, slave ship wrecks have been found, mm -hmm. and it's for, uh, there's a few reasons for it, but basically uh, the biggest reason is that when people are looking for ships, they're looking for treasures. Mm -hmm. And they know that they're not going to find any treasures on a slave ship. All right. Money, you money, know, money. Yes, they were, the slave ships were holding cargo and slaves, and that was it. So there wasn't any, anything valuable really, nope. yeah. that were on slave ships. So they're not going to dive or go looking for slave ships. Okay. 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 Uh, and uh, one of the most obvious reasons is that uh, they deteriorate. Mm -hmm. You know, so especially if they get into the water, water deteriorates very quickly. Okay. You know, so, um, and, and then there are things. Water deteriorates things quickly. Oh, yes, very, very quickly. Especially you wood. Know, especially wood. You know, mm -hmm. and even iron deteriorates after a while, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so really to, to have these things preserved, we know that it's going to take a lot of money to do that. Okay, you mean in, after they actually find a ship, it's the, the cost of preserving this location so that they can do the research on what it is, where, where it came from, What's, what else is on the ship? Because, you know, they're going to have to dig through sand. They got to do a whole lot of things. But I guess we can get into that now. Yes, yes. Well, uh, yes, because we, we know that when these ships go down, that, uh, again, that they're exposed to water. Mm -hmm. The ones that sit in, wa in water are going to deteriorate. So the only parts that are not going to deteriorate or deteriorate as quickly are the ones or, or the pieces and parts that get buried in the sand and the sediment underground. Okay. You know, so if they get into that, then the sand can preserve the things, but it's still going to deteriorate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So again, the thing is, is that once, if they were to bring that out into the open air, then the open air is going to deteriorate the things. You know, so, um, so, so those things have, those factors have to be taken into consideration even when they find any of these things. And again, we're, so we're talking about a lot of logistics and a, a lot of the process of preserving things before you can even get it on shore so that it can go through the testing and the verification on, on that level of things. Yes. And so again, yes. a lot of money has to be spent in order to do this. Yes, and, and, and over centuries mm -hmm. that some of these ships have been buried under the sand, sand then accumulates. Right. And so some of these things are buried under six and eight feet of sand, mm -hmm. you know, uh, over, the, the, over the centuries that they have right. been underground. Two, three, four, five hundred years sometimes. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so, so again, you have to know where they went down and then you have to know, that then you have to have the equipment that is going to find these things buried that far underneath 
of the uh, of the sand. Uh -huh. And so it's, it's, it's very, it's expensive. Right, right, right. <laughs> it however, is expensive. However, just like you said, the ones that they do find buried under the sand, they have a, they can find a lot more uh, of the ship itself and a lot of the things that was on the ship can be preserved. They can be preserved. And, um, and, we, and we are going to discuss some of those things, you know, um, as we go through some, uh, when we go through some of the sites, we're going to say how they, what, what process was done okay. with, uh, especially one in particular, there, there was a, a, a process because some of the artifacts that they found are now in a museum. Okay, well, let's talk about that. I think it's called the Slave Rex Project. Yes, uh, yes. Okay, so yeah, let's talk to, let's give them some information regarding this ongoing process of um, organization out there trying to find uh, slave wrecks so that they can document and, and preserve that part of our history. Yes, yeah, so there, it, it is called, again, the Slave Rex Project, and it was founded in 2008. And it was founded by researchers from George Washington University from the Ezekiel Museums of South Africa, the South African Heritage Resource Agency, the United States Park Service, Diving with a Purpose, and the African Center for Heritage Activities. And even with all of those organizations that started this in 2008, the African American History Museum of the United States, that's in DC, joined this also a couple of years later. Okay, and so, so if you don't mind me jumping in real, real, real fast, you just named a whole lot of organizations that have been actively for what, almost 10 years? Matter of fact, it's 2018 <laughs> yes. now, for 10 years, actively um, participating in the research and analysis to actually, and fundraising in order to go out there and document this. Why Slave you think- Slave ships in particular. <laughs> yeah, well, okay, we back. Had a little bit of technical difficulties with our logo, but we're going to keep it moving. And we hate to ruin the day, so we're just going to keep that going, right? Okay, let's go. Okay, so centered around this slave, uh, the Slave Project mm -hmm. and uh, all of these various organizations that have been putting this work in for over 10 years, um, uh, providing fact-based research and analysis and uh, also doing a lot of fundraising in order to provide the general public with this type of information. Mm -hmm. You know, yet the question floated around in our community for quite a while, you know. None yes. of, you know <laughs> however, let's, let's take a look at what these organizations have found and other organizations um, as far as actual slave wrecks. Okay, all right. Okay. I have to put my glasses on. All right. Okay, um, but one site was discovered in 1991 okay. off of uh, Martinique. And this is in the, uh, in, in the, in the Gulf, mm -hmm. okay in the islands, and there is a, uh, it is a small island where a slave ship went off. Okay, what they found, they found an elephant tusk that was found in the coral, and they're saying that that probably marked the site of the slave trade. Okay. I'll explain that in a second, okay. Okay? okay? It says that all that remained of the ship itself were an anchor and a short length of chain together with a hinge from the rudder, all right? Around the ivory tusk, there were a few hundred bricks, but that's all that they found of mm -hmm. the ship, and it says that the ship had completely broken up. Okay, well, okay. so, you know, there's a lot of interesting things there that we can touch on as we move further along in the discussion, mm -hmm. but one of the things that point out, now that jumped right out at me are, is bricks. Why, you know, they ship in bricks. You can make bricks anywhere, right? right. <laughs> Why well, ship bricks? Um, but we'll get back. I guess we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, we don't want to just dwell, and there's a lot to go over. So let's talk about another site. Okay. Um, close to a hundred elephant tusks, mm -hmm. okay, were found in 1987 at another site. And this one is off of France. This is off of Brittany, France, mm -hmm. okay? Again, they, they didn't find any uh, trace of the ship itself, but it said that what remained were some cargo, uh, some beads that they used for trade, okay, okay? a copper bracelet, mm -hmm. and uh, manila, which was a, uh, a form of trade, a form of, of, of money, okay, that was used uh, off of the African coast that, okay. they, that they used um, 
as a form of currency off the African coast. Right. Now, which is also something interesting that we can get into a little bit later on as far as the beads were concerned. Um, but this one is specific. And also the elephant tusks. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, so, again, a lot, you know, a lot to talk about. Um, but let's go on. Let's talk about another. Let's, let's just name a few more sites for them before okay. we go. Okay. All right. Uh, there was another ship that was found. Uh, it, this ship, as a matter of fact, went down in 1841. Okay. 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 And this was found. Um, it, it, it was found off of the coast of Australia. No. Uh, yes, it was found off mm -hmm. the coast of Australia. Right. Okay. Right, right, right. But what happened... <laughs> Do you, want to, do you want to talk about, well, go ahead. Well, let me talk about, yeah, let me finish talking about that ship. Okay. okay. So that I can s explain what happened, okay? Okay. It was seized in 1837, all right? The, the United States Royal Army found the ship when it was engaged in the unlawful trade of slave trade. Mm -hmm. So in 1837, it was unlawful for them to have the slave trade. So the, the army seized the ship, and then they just refitted the ship to be just a regular cargo ship. Mm -hmm. And then it went back out and as being a cargo ship, but then they later found it off of the coast of Australia. Okay. So that's how they know it was a car, that, that they knew it was a slave ship, mm -hmm. because it had been seized and they changed it over. And so they had documents. Yes. So they, yes. They, and they know exactly where their ship was. Yes. And just to, you know, just to clarify a point, um, it, was the, the, it was the importation of slaves into the United States was illegal. Yes. Not slavery itself. Uh, yes. You know, however... Yeah, we we you explained know, that in, our, in, in, in part two. In part two. So yes. if you want to learn more about that, definitely check out part two of Where Are the Slave Ships? And so I know, so let's talk about another site. We got another site to talk about. Okay, where yes. Are the where are the slave ships? What do you mean, where are the slave ships? They're everywhere. <laughs> now, this particular slave ship <clears throat> was found off of the coast of uh, Cape Town, Africa. And, and it was some of these artifacts that are on display in the African American Museum in Washington, D.C. What? Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> what is <They're> interesting? <laughs> yes. What is interesting about this ship is that it, um, it, it was leaving Africa on its way to the Americas. Okay. 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 And while it was leaving, it, it went under water. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so they knew exactly where this slave ship was <laughs> all, okay. this For, all the time. So they, they could actually, known. you know, and if you're not familiar with this, what's, what was the name of this ship again? Okay, wait a minute. Let me see what the name of it. Um, the Sao Jose. The Sao Jose. Okay. okay. You know, that way y'all can check that out. But if, if you're not, if you're not uh, aware of that, they could act, they actually saved a lot of the slaves that were on that ship at that time. They slaved, they, they saved half of the slaves that were on that. Mm -hmm. They saved all of the crew. <laughs> of course. Of course, <laughs> right. <laughs> that, hold on, wait a second, the captain didn't go down? <laughs> of course not. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and, and they did save, they, they, and they did save half of the slaves. Okay, you know, you know yeah, and, you know, you know. Of course, that was, that was the least part of the cargo. That right, was, right, right, know. right, and you know, we're not making light of it, but, you know, sometimes you got to laugh at this stuff because it's crazy, you know. Now, so nonetheless, they actually knew exactly where this ship was. And so for how, how many years, no one even bothered to do any, because it, it wasn't important and it wasn't worth any money. And, and, and not only that, though, because of, of its location, mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the ocean is, is very violent, uh, you know, very close to the shore. You know, you have your tides that come in and out all of the time. Okay. So even when, when they went down to this ship and they, you know, they started diving for artifacts and things, um, a lot of the things were buried under six to eight feet of sand. Mm. And they, when they would retrieve some of the items, they couldn't, they couldn't bring everything at one time, you know. Okay. And so some things they would leave. Mm -hmm. uh, and the thing is, is that when they went, maybe a few days later, it was covered back up with three to four feet of sand. Because again of of the ocean, so well, let's and, talk. and that is something that you that you have to take into consideration. Again, this one was very close to shore; it's mm -hmm. very easy to get to. 
but because of the ocean and uh, and what happens, mm -hmm. is is just difficult and again uh, time consuming and. Um, a, a very high monetary cost. Right. Well, let's talk about some of the things that they found on this particular ship because it gives, you know, credence to what we, you know, we, we what we expect to find on other uh, uh, shipwrecks. Yes. Slave and, wrecks. And, yes. Okay. And we can also discuss what we were talking about the elephant tusks. Okay. Also. Right. And okay. the beads. Yes. Mm -hmm. But what they found on this ship is is an iron ballast. Okay. okay? And iron ballasts were used. It says to offset the relatively light weight of the ship's human cargo. Mm, that's really interesting, which draws us back to Those the bricks. bricks. <laughs> right. You know, that, you know, why are you shipping bricks to offset the cargo? Because human weight is different. First of all, you know, from dead weight is different <laughs> from live weight. And so dead slaves <laughs> would carry weight differently on the ship than live slaves just to start you or know. or even even if you say maybe a 50 pound sack of potatoes you know mm -hmm. you, you, you're packing a whole bunch of those the that weight is going to be it's less centralized first of all it's not moving around right mm -hmm. you know and yes and again yeah and they needed it to balance the ships okay right and so so one of the things that we're going to be looking for are weights that they would put on these uh, slave ships to balance the, mm -hmm. the cargo to make sure it doesn't sink. Yes, <laughs> yes. And right. you know, I guess a ballast in some places, bricks in other places. Huh? Right, <laughs> if you don't have the ballast. <laughs> <laughs> Cheaper, <laughs> right? <Go> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, but, uh, but they also found, uh, they found a wooden pulley block, mm -hmm. okay? They found remnants of shackles, and these were covered, they said, in, in organic and inorganic material that had built up around them over centuries being in the sea mm -hmm. okay okay and really it it took them uh, it for them to find out that they were even shackles because they were e they were even deteriorating okay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but what they did is that um, it says that the remains of these fragile shackles could only be identified using either CT scans or x-rays and when they did the scans, they said that they were able to find the ghost of a shackle that remained in the remnants right. that they found. Okay. Okay. It says the iron is barely there, but what you can see is a clear outline of what once existed as a shackle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And I see here, we also have a quote from one of the divers that's talk about the tides being like a giant washing machine, mm -hmm. you know, so you can imagine all of the, the sand and, you know, everything just being moved around consistently over there. And it's just going to, it's just going to wear everything down. Nothing is going to stay underneath there permanently. Yes. And they said that, that, um, even after things have been carefully vacuumed off within a few hours, mm. the sand had recovered the site and within a day or so, it says two to three feet of sand back over the site. Okay, wow. So, <laughs> and uh, again, it was from this ship where some of some of these artifacts are being are, are being displayed in the African American Museum in Washington D.C. Okay, so you know, so you know, you can look at those, and you know, I guess to get some uh, historical context, you know, as a part of that. Tour. All know. right, so we discussed uh, some of those sites, and let's let's get into some of the sites that might be a little bit closer uh, for people to get to here in the states. We got a few, uh, well, one in particular here, a site here in the states that we can give a lot of information I ain't no more money, more problems. I saw them this way to tell you the truth. Allow me to reintroduce myself Welcome. to the cruel world that we all live in. Still chasing them dividends, whether it's thousands or millions. It's still a hustle, ain't it? The grind is universal. Might take muscle to gain the upper hand. Some understand there ain't no perfect picture painted. I, I do, do what, what I gotta do. I ain't no different than you. I ain't no different than you. Shit. More money, more problems, I saw them this way to tell you the truth Allow me to reintroduce myself Welcome to the cruel world that we all live in man. Still chasing them dividends, whether it's thousands or millions It's still a hustle, ain't it? The grind is universal Might take muscle to gain the upper hand Some understand there ain't no perfect picture painted I do what I gotta do, I ain't no different than you 
All right, so we discussed uh, some of those sites, and let's, let's get into some of the sites that might be a little bit closer uh, for people to get to here in the States. We got a few, uh, well, one in particular here, a site here in the States that we can give a lot of information about. Yes, and uh, now again, there are a few other sites. They're not really around um, the United States that have been found, mm -hmm. okay? Okay. But this one has been found off of the Keys of, um, of Florida. Okay. And it's called uh, the Henrietta Marie. And the, Henry the Henrietta Marie was discovered in 1972 by treasure hunters. Again, people that are diving for treasures, okay? Uh, it sank off of uh, Key West, Florida in 1700. And it was on its way back to England after it had dropped off um, a shipment of slaves in Jamaica. Okay. Okay, so, okay. so they do know that. Okay. Um, and uh, it says that very little of the ship was found, but it, you know, they, they do know that it was a, a, a cargo ship and that it was a cargo ship that was uh, shipping slaves. Okay. Okay. All right. So give, give us some more information about the history of the Henrietta Marie. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> since we know what it is, you know, since we have a name, let's talk about it. <laughs> All right. Well, at first, uh, at first it belonged to the French. Okay. 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 And the French were using it in the uh, in the Anglo-French War, and that war ended in 1697. Okay. All right. After that war, the English or the England, the English Navy mm -hmm. captured the ship, and they brought it back to England. And when they did that, they refitted the ship. Okay. okay. So another one of those ships converted to ship slaves. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, it said that they refitted the ship and the new owners renamed the ship the Henrietta Marie. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it says that, that it had two voyages. So it only had two voyages as a slave ship. Mm. All right. Mm. The first one was in uh, November of 97. And uh, it says that it was able to carry many different kinds of freight because it had many different cargo decks. Okay. So it didn't just have one or two cargo decks, it had many cargo decks, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And it says that they, that they had things for trade, including iron, beads, pewter, weapons, and slaves. And uh, it says that the Henrietta Marie could carry about 200 people in their cargo area. Okay, right? okay. So uh, that was the first, the first ship, uh, the first, trip it was in uh late of um in 1698 it began its first ship and then it came back okay, okay. so it went came back came back and to then it came back to england okay okay it went to africa to america back to england back to england okay okay when it got back to england it got back in um in late 1698 all right all right so when it came back they began fixing it again so that it could go back out again. Mm -hmm. So the ship had to be refitted. Mm -hmm. It had to, you know, things had to get repaired. They had to get a new crew because, you know, again, that was, you know, almost two years had passed. So they had to get a new crew and they had to get new investors also because, you know, every, every, Every time the ship sails out, you have different investors. You know, you just don't have the same investors that invest all the time, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so you had, you had to get all of these things together before a ship would even sail. Okay. 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 So it, it wasn't until late of 1699. So it took over a year before the ship was able to sail again. Okay. 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 And uh, so... Well, b before you go on, for mm -hmm. those that's, uh, that are interested in doing the research on this particular ship, one of the things that we wanted to point out was that if you are going to slavevoyages.org and you're looking for the ship, they actually have it leaving port in 1700, not 1699. So that's a little bit, you know, a difference between the database and history. You know, just yes, and, and it took us it took us a minute for <laughs> us to find it. You know, because when we went there, we started searching in 1698, 1697, because it did have a, a, a voyage. voyage. Right, right. But uh, but we were able to find it in 1700. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about some of the things that was found on the Henrietta Marie. Okay. Now, what they found is uh, it says that they found 80 sets of shackles. 80. 
okay. two cast iron cannons, mm -hmm. which many of those ships, they, they travel with cannons. Well, it used to be a warship, right? Uh, well, it, was, it was a ship used on war, so cannon, and, and, cannon. And, and really, all ships travel with cannons. I mm -hmm. mean, they're going, look, can you say Pirates of the Caribbean? <laughs> you know, so, and, and it, so they all had cannons on them, okay? Okay. Uh, uh, glass tray beads. So here we go with the beads. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which the Negroes um, would like to use for trade, that's right? What, that's, yeah, they that's said the Negroes. Quote, right? Yes, Negroes. Negroes, right? Yes, <laughs> like to use the, the beads is for trade, yes. Uh, stock iron tray bars. Okay, uh -huh, so uh -huh. they had that. Ivory elephant's teeth. So again, here we go with the elephant's teeth. And remember, we said before that elephant tusks were found. Right. And the reason why they, and, and that's how they could identify that some of these ships were slave ships mm -hmm. because if the ship did not stop in Africa, then it would not have, mm -hmm. <laughs> it would not have tusks, it would not have teeth, it would mm -hmm. not have the manila, the trade good, you know. And so it wouldn't have a lot of the things, specifically ivory. Right, yeah, mm -hmm. and yes, things that, that are known to come from the African Right, coast. indigenous to Africa y yes. itself, right. Okay, Especially and... On that, Ralph. All right, and they also found uh, a large collection of pewter, English-made pewter tankards. They found basins, spoons, bottles, and they also found the ship's bell. Okay, and um, the ship's bell. Let's talk about that for a mm -hmm. second. <laughs> Tell and us what a ship bell is. Number, you know, first okay, of all. well, really, yeah, the, ship, the, the bells were made to identify the, uh, the ships, that they often had the name and the date stamped on the bell that 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 would identify yeah, you know like would identify the yes right. they do yes. that now they you know every boat has a name yes okay <laughs> now when they found the bell the bell had been under water for 300 years mm. okay wow. so it was it was totally covered as it with marine growth okay mm -hmm. there was stuff mm -hmm. all over we're going to show an Natural image coral. Of, a, a partial image of, of what some of it you know okay. the, uh, what it looked like yes and it says that after removing some of the growth that they found the name Henrietta Marie and they found the date 1699 inscribed on that bill okay okay mm -hmm. okay so now now that they found the bell because uh, now really what happened is that they found the ship in 72 but it wasn't, it was like almost 10 years later when they went back down mm -hmm. uh, for, the, for the dive, okay? Okay, okay? And when they went back down for the dive, that's when they found the bell, okay? And now that they found the bell, they can now go back into records. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like we did when we went to Slave Voyages, we could go now and even in slavevoyages.org, we could find out who the captain of the ship was. We could find mm -hmm. out how many people were there. Mm -hmm. You know, there's several items that we could even find just on slavevoyages.org. But if you go back to England, you'll find a lot more. You'll find the captain's logs and right. all the information that, they, you know, so all of these things are preserved, <laughs> you know. So, so there are things that you can find out Th that in history, you know, that if we didn't have those captain's logs and if we didn't have those things, you know, how, how do you preserve history? Right. You know, and right. so so we must go back to these things mm -hmm. so that we can preserve the accurate history. Yeah. We have to have it. Yeah, we have to go to those records because those are the only records that we have that document these things. Yep. And then we got to make sure that we have the correct perspective from an indigenous as far as indigenousness is concerned as we factually provide this to the public. Yes. You know, it's really important. <laughs> yes, it is. Because again, if, if these divers had not found that bell to identify that ship, that just would have been another, another ship. Just another ship. We're not sure what kind of ship. Exactly. However, we do know one thing, no treasure, let's move on. <laughs> yes, not exactly. Worth nothing to us, right? <laughs> We're actually, yes. you know, and I guess now, and again, as, as you said before, as we begin to wrap the situation up, we might have a little bit more but the organizations, you know, over the last 10 years have been, you know, uh, looking for funding and, and getting started. And, you know, when people ask questions, you know, it's not just, it's, it's a responsibility for individuals to get, you know, to answer the question. We can't just allow questions to float around without being answered. It, it, it and you have to do your due diligence to find the information also. It's not something that you could just go and Google and you will get an answer the first time that you Google it. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, it is extensive research. We, we, we did this over, over several weeks, mm -hmm. just this one topic.
and 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 really that was on top of research that we had already done right right you right. know so there so this is you know it's not something that you could just go in 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 two minutes to find the answers well you know and as far as other individuals that's out here that are you know being heard and seen is really a, you know we have a responsibility as indigenous peoples to be responsible for ourselves, our actions, our words, and the impact that it has on our community. And yes, and to be accurate with the information that we are uh, passing out to people. Right, we don't want to. As accurate as possible. As, uh, yeah, and it's always room for development, it's always room for growth. Oh, yes, <laughs> because history is not static. Right, and, and with that, you know, um, which is where I really wanted to take this at, and as far as we're um, closing out, is that, and you know, if, if we have questions that we would like to be answered, um, and we want them to be answered by, from, from our perspective, then we have to be willing to put the work in to actually get that done. And so, you know, instead of having a question like, where are the slave ships to run around for a year, have all these people screaming this, you know, somebody should have actually went on ahead and said, let's, let me, find, let's, out. Do, let's find <laughs> out, you know, it's not, you know, it's not any one individual's responsibility, it's our responsibility as an indigenous people. Especially now, it's very important as we are in the very infancy stages of our re-education and reintroduction to our, our omitted history. It's mm -hmm. really important. Yes, it is. You know, it's yes, it is. You know, responsibility is important. Okay, well, before we wrap it up, I, I would like to just mention two places that are here in the United States that have uh, that have that have devoted their time to this Henrietta Marie, to yeah. the slave ship itself. One of, okay? them, one of them by us, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, one is in uh, West Virginia, okay. Okay? Okay. and that in, and is from the West Virginia Division of Culture and History, mm -hmm. and you can go look that up. And as a matter of fact, we will have, uh, we're going to have our bibliography at the end of this, and, and these places that I'm mentioning, we'll also have them there so that you can go look for the information yourself if that's, if you would like to. Okay. And the other, the other place is called the Mel Fisher Maritime Heritage Society and Historical Museum, and that one is in Key West, Florida. Mm -hmm. So well, these two places, and as a matter of fact, the, the West Virginia uh, Division of Culture and History, they even made a replica of the ship. It is a, it's a smaller model, but they did make a replica of it. We are, we're talking mm -hmm. about the Henry Maria Marie. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And as we discuss the Henry, just, you know, uh, let's not leave out the, what's this called here? It's called the, the National Association of Black Scuba Divers. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, let's just discuss what they did with respect to this Henry Aaron Marie and about, you know, our active participation as us as a people and how we really need to jump into this. Let's talk about what they did. Yes, well, they are part of one of those groups that is called Diving with a Purpose okay. and these, uh, these black divers. And what they did is they decided to, to make a plaque that, um, uh, that, was, that is a memorial. Mm -hmm. And it is a uh, bronze marker, which is facing the African shore, and it is it is a marker that they placed there in 1993, and they placed it at the site of where they found the Henrietta Marie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and again, we will we will show an example yeah, of we that. Can, we can have that show um, right now yes. as we wrap it up, and uh, you know, and again, you know, it's a lot of other things. There's a lot of other directions that you can take this questions. And, you know, we would like to ask people, too, because, you know, we, we all should be supporting each other and developing this information um, uh, from a historically, uh, uh, from an indigenous historical pr perspective. However, we have to make sure it's fact-based as yes, well. Yes, yes. You know, and again, I guess that would go for everything, you know, as we develop this uh, and we, we step into this new age of things, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so with that, you know, um, I guess, you know, we could show some of the big biographies before we show the credits right now. And we'd like to say thank you very much. Um, please look, uh, please look us up on Facebook at Indigenous Education. Uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel if you have not subscribed yet. Uh, we're going to be coming out with a lot of new information. If you are interested through Indigenous Education, we are hosting bi-weekly uh, educational lessons on the history and the development of Indigenous peoples. Um, right now, <laughs> and so fact-based, fact-based, yeah. <laughs> and so, if you're interested, uh, please email us, and uh, you can um, we can give you the registration process. And uh, again, they're ten dollar donations if you're interested in that. And be on the lookout; we have a couple other shows 
coming up. Uh, we're going to be answering some comments and some questions. So that always they always like that one right there. Okay. We kind of like that one too. Yes. And we're going to be uh, doing a few other things. So please stay tuned. Be on the lookout for us the rest of this year. It's going to be a great year. So with that being said, peace. Peace. different than you, shit. More money, more problems, I solemnly swear to tell you the truth, allow me to reintroduce myself Welcome. to the cruel world that we all living in, still chasing them dividends, whether it's thousands or millions, it's still a hustle, ain't it? The grind is universal, might take muscle to gain the upper hand, some understand there ain't no perfect picture painted, I, I do, do what, what I gotta do. do, I ain't no different than you, shit. From the corner to the corporate offices People around here Ain't playing about they money, sunny Hungry wolves on the prowl But I'm a veteran Most decorated four-star general Colin Powell And it don't take a rocket scientist To know that I'll Never, never surrender my flag Never pretend Yamasee ain't shining I'm the golden child